Thank you very much for attending this presentation. My name is David Foster. I'm the CEO and Managing Director of Island Pharmaceuticals. Island Pharmaceuticals is a publicly traded company on the Australian Securities Exchange. Of course, we have to give you this disclaimer. Island Pharmaceuticals is a mid-clinical stage drug development company. We're focused on repurposing strategies for the development of antiviral therapeutics. As I mentioned, we listed on the ASX last April. We had a very successful IPO, heavily oversubscribed. We raised $7.5 million Aussie, which will be enough for us to complete our phase two clinical trial. I mentioned that we're focused on repurposing strategies, and the reason we like that is it, it enables us to move forward very quickly by relying on work done by other people with a particular molecule to generate preclinical and clinical data at times, use that data, in support of a new IND for a new indication. In our case, that is a dengue infection as we're moving forward with the dengue program. Um, our lead program is in mosquito-borne viruses. We have a upcoming phase two clinical trial in dengue infection. The reason we like drug repurposing, as I've already mentioned, is it is a way to capitalize on effort and money spent by third parties to develop preclinical and clinical data that can support your uh, molecule in a new indication. Um, we know that it takes 10 to 15 years to develop a drug, north of $2 billion to develop a drug from start to finish. When you're repurposing, you can save substantial time and money. Um, and we're not alone. Other people are also looking at repurposing strategies. The global market for drug repurposing has increased substantially over the last few years. So we know that other people are also looking at this as a viable alternative to traditional drug development strategies. And in fact, when you look at it on a timeline like this, um, again, it takes 10 to 15 years to develop a drug from scratch. And when you repurpose, you can essentially shave two thirds of the drug development path off of this timeline because you can eliminate the preclinical, the IND enabling studies in some instances, um, potentially phase one studies you don't need to do um, if they are successful and you have the appropriate dosage, which we do in our case. So we're able to move straight to a phase two clinical study, again, saving substantial time, getting to value inflection points much more quickly than we might otherwise be able to do. So I mentioned that we're focused on dengue virus and other mosquito-borne viruses with dengue being our lead program. And why are we worried about dengue? When you look around and you pay attention to what's going on with the dengue virus, you'll recognize that it is there's a significant unmet medical need. Literally half the world's population, around 3.9 billion people, are at risk of infection with the dengue virus every year. There are limited available options, and I'll give you some more information about that shortly, but it's a substantial problem, and it's a growing problem because we're seeing the virus move into areas where it's not been traditionally seen before. Um, fortunately for us, ESLO 101 was identified as a molecule that had both prophylactic and potentially therapeutic um, activities. Uh, this was evidenced in cell culture models and robust animal data. So we have very good animal data and different models of flavivirus infections, and namely dengue and Zika. Um, so our strategy would then be to move forward with dengue infection, the phase two study in dengue, Upon approval, then we'll springboard into other flavivirus infections to expand our label. Notably, we have the opportunity, at least today, to pursue a priority review voucher. Um, we are eligible based on the current standing of the molecule and the program. It's a very troubling time when you look around and, and you're looking for dengue infections and, and what's going on. And obviously the whole world is talking about COVID-19, rightfully so, because it's obviously a huge problem. But what we're hearing, and we talk to people in India and in Brazil, Latin America, um, they're really battling two pandemics simultaneously, and it's COVID-19 as well as dengue. And in fact, there's a lot of uh, um, headlines here on this slide but, but they're very relevant. We put them here for a reason. Just a couple of days ago, for instance, Brazil issued an epidemic alert for dengue and Zika and chikungunya infections. Um, we've also seen Colombia issue a dengue fever alert. Uh, problems in India where they're having substantial problems, huge number of dengue infections. 
So there's a significant need. As I mentioned, we're talking to people in, in all of these countries, and they're very interested to follow what we're doing, interested in the development of ISLA 101. So another problem that we've seen is as a result of global warming, we're seeing these viruses move out of areas where they've tra traditionally been identified. So with dengue infections, you typically think of a, a tropical climate, um, somewhat equatorial, and that has been the case, but now we're seeing these viruses move into areas in the southern part of the US, the northern part of Australia, where they haven't been seen before. And then when you look at the, the geographies associated with West Nile virus, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, truly it is a significant problem where half the world's population is at risk of infection. I put this slide in here because I wanted you to see where the areas of dengue infection today are, and I want to compare this to the, the upcoming slide. But um, again, as I've mentioned, Latin America is a significant problem, the Middle East, India, significant infections um, with dengue. But if you look at Australia or if you look at the United States, it's not too bad. You can see a little bit uh, of infections in, in Florida or in the northern part of Australia. However, if you look at the predictions of what's going to happen in just the next 30 years, uh, it's a very different scenario. Forecast of the locations of the dengue infections just in the, in the next 30 years demonstrate there's a substantial increase. If you look in the southeast part of the United States, um, where there was none before, there's significant amount of dengue infection predicted to occur. Likewise, if you look in Australia, the entire northern half of Australia now is ripe for infection with dengue infection. So uh, a significant and growing problem. I think it's important to think about how the dengue virus is spread uh, and as, because that in, it elucidates ways that we can think about attacking the virus. So you have an uninfected mosquito that will bite an infected human. The mosquito therefore is infected and can bite a second human that's uninfected. That second human then becomes really an incubator for the propagation of the virus. And then a mosquito bites them and the cycle continues. So the mosquito is the vector that transmits the virus from one person to the other. What this does for me is it highlights a few areas where we might be able to attack this virus. One, you could attack the mosquito itself. We're aware of companies and groups that are working to attack the mosquitoes, and I think that's an important strategy. Uh, two, you can think about vaccines. We're aware of groups that are working on vaccines for the dengue and other flaviviruses. Um, there's one approved vaccine. It has a very narrow label right now, so there's still tremendous need for alternative strategies. We think small molecules are the way to go for alternative strategies. Um, not unlike what we've observed with COVID-19. So we had vaccines that were highly effective, but people are very excited about the recent approval of the small molecules to attack COVID-19. And, and we believe that it will take all three of these aspects, targeting the mosquitoes, vaccines, as well as small molecules to appropriately handle the, the dengue epidemic. We put this slide in here to highlight the fact that there's really very few available solutions. Um, if you look at dengue in the first column, go to the, the bottom of that. If you look at vaccine availability, I mentioned before there is one approved vaccine for dengue. It has a very narrow label. There's no effective therapies and the numbers are staggering. Um, for most of these flaviviruses, there's limited vaccine availability, no effective drug therapy. And again, the numbers are staggering. Uh, and it's a significant problem. Um, we put a picture in here. Uh, this is a baby that was born to a mother who was infected with Zika. The baby was born with microencephaly, which is one of the problems associated with a Zika infection. And Zika is still out there. You may not hear about it all the time, but it does pop up around the globe periodically. India over the last year had a couple of Zika outbreaks. So it's a very real problem. Fortunately, ISLA 101 may be an effective therapy or preventative for Zika as well, again, based on our preclinical data. So let's talk a little bit more about ISLA 101. ISLA 101 was initially developed as a cancer therapy. J&J &J developed this many, many years ago as a potential cancer therapy, but it's never been approved for anything anywhere in the world. Um, it's been in 45, at least 45 clinical trials around the world. So many regulatory groups have signed off on initiating clinical studies. 
demonstrating its excellent safety profile. Um, there's a strong regulatory history and acceptance around the globe. And so we believe that we will be able to move forward. And in fact, we've had a pre-IND meeting with the FDA where they've confirmed that we can move forward with a phase two clinical study. I've already mentioned that ESLA 101 has broad activity against all four strains of the dengue virus, as well as Zika, West Nile, and yellow fever. So in, in some respects, it could be a pan and flaviviral small molecule. Uh, which we're very excited about. We have in vitro data from a variety of cell culture systems with many of these viruses. And as I've already mentioned, we have robust animal data with um, Zika as well as dengue infections. So in very lethal animal models of a dengue infection, ESLA 101 was protective. This is a map showing the, the countries and jurisdictions where clinical trials have been run. Clearly, most of these have been run in the United States, but many in Canada, Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and Australia, and New Zealand as well. So what that enables us to do is relying on the preclinical and clinical work by other people, that in combination with the robust animal data that we have, we can move forward with a phase two clinical trial. And we call this the PEACH study, and we're going to call it that because the, the full name is a phase 2A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study for the prophylactic examination of an antiviral in a dengue challenge model. So we're going to be running a challenge study. Uh, the study will be run at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. Um, and the way that study is going to work is we enroll healthy individuals and then infect them with an attenuated strain of the dengue virus. This is a viral strain that's been developed by Walter Reed. And in fact, Walter Reed has been running phase one studies with this challenge virus. Um, we have a CRADA in place with Walter Reed, Cooperative Research and Development Agreement. Um, and under the CRADA, Walter Reed is gonna give us access to the viral strain. They're also giving us data, all of the data out of their phase one study. So in essence, that's our control arm has been done already as we will enroll up to 16 people, four cohorts of four individuals and run a dose finding study um, comparing our, our treated individuals with those people with a control study from Walter Reed. So our study, we will pre-treat people for three days, pre-treat the healthy individuals for three days, then infect them and then continue treating them for the next 20 days. The readout will be viremia, a variety of symptoms associated with a dengue infection. Um, and again, we'll be able to compare those to the data obtained from the Walter Reed studies. The strategy then is in short order, we'll file our IND and open our phase two study, the dengue challenge model, the PEACH study. We plan to move straight forward uh, pursuing the dengue study. We could look at a second virus if we had a partner or somebody who was interested in looking at that. Um, but our strategy is to move forward with dengue studies, get that drug approved for the dengue infection, and then we'll expand the label to Zika or chikungunya or one of these other viruses where we have preclinical data. I have put a, a star by Zika and chikungunya as well as dengue because these are viruses on the list of diseases that are eligible for tropical disease priority review vouchers. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. So the commercial opportunity we believe is vast. Uh, we've already mentioned the significant number of infections every year. We have mentioned the number of people at risk of infection every year is a huge number of individuals. So while as we look in the United States, there's not a lot of dinky today, we're aware that many people in the U.S. travel to endemic regions. Um, also, the military is sending people into endemic regions. We think they may be interested in Eastland 101 as well. Third, we're talking to people in India, in Latin America, about national outbreaks. Uh, they're very concerned, and we believe that there's an opportunity for us to, to work with, with companies, um, with entities there in those countries and regions to, to put ISLA 101, potential government stockpiles, and as another commercial opportunity. And finally, I've already mentioned the priority review voucher. I'd like to give you a little bit more information about that. So when you submit your new drug application for review at the FDA, that typically takes about 12 months to complete the review. If you get priority review, they can shorten that 12-month period to around six months. And so there's a significant value by getting to the market faster, you can imagine. 
Um, the FDA recognized that there was a significant opportunity there and they created the Priority Review Voucher Program as an incentive to encourage companies to develop drugs for underserved diseases. There are a couple of types of PRVs, as we'll call them. We're focused on the Neglected Tropical Disease Priority Review Voucher Program. And the way this works is if you get your drug first approved in an indication on a list of diseases, and dengue, chikungunya, and Zika are on this list of diseases, then you can get a priority review voucher. And the voucher enables you to get priority review of a second program. So you have your initial program that will need to get priority review itself. Your drug gets first approved in this indication and you get it approved in a, uh, in a disease on a list of tropical diseases, which we're uh, right now three of the, the diseases that we have preclinical data are on that list of diseases. Then you get the voucher that can be used for another program. And the beautiful thing about this is you can sell these vouchers and Big Pharma likes to collect these vouchers. There's a significant market for them. Um, I put, I think, the last 10 PRV acquisitions on this slide here. They typically sell for around $100 million. So we view this as icing on the cake. We're very focused on getting our drug approved. We want to be a commercial entity and sell this drug. Um, if we're eligible for a voucher at the time, we think that would be pretty nice icing on the cake. In addition to ISLA 101, we have engaged in a couple of other research collaboration agreements. Uh, first, we have a research collaboration agreement with Monash University. Monash is the university in Australia from whom we initially licensed ISLA 101. Professor David Jans there has systems set up to study viral infections, and we have engaged them to do another research uh, study on our behalf. And so we'll be working with Monash University to study molecules with clinical history, put them in David Jan's um, assay system, and look for new antiviral molecules against different viruses. Likewise, we've recently initiated a collaboration agreement with Griffith University, also in Australia. Uh, the technology that we'll be working with at Griffith University and Monash, they're quite different technologies. The assays are very different. We like the fact that we're gonna pursue these, these new antivirals with different techniques. Um, as we just increase the likelihood uh, of finding, getting a successful hit. So we'll be working with Professor Ron Quinn and Professor Suresh Mahalingam at Griffith University on our second research collaboration. Which leads us to our, our drug development pipeline. ESO 101 is our lead program. We have an upcoming PEACH study that will be initiating a phase two clinical trial shortly. We then will be able to expand that to other mosquito-borne viruses. Um, then finally, we'll have our Monash and Griffith collaborations. We'll have molecules coming out of those collaborations to put into this pipeline in a pipeline expansion strategy. So we do have some key collaborations and alliances. We've already mentioned Monash University and Griffith University. Compounds Australia is an entity, an institute that is housed at Griffith University, and Compounds Australia actually houses many different libraries of small molecules um, with different characteristics including they have libraries of molecules that have clinical history. So these are the libraries that we'll be using as we put these into the collaboration agreement at Monash and at Griffith University. I've already mentioned the U.S. Army. We have a CRADA in place with the U.S. Army where they'll be giving us the, the virus that we'll be using in our clinical trial. They'll also be providing to us all of the data out of their completed phase one clinical trial. We have an agreement in place with Catalan, who will be manufacturing our clinical material, and the National Cancer Institute has given us the IND for ISLA 101, the formulation that we'll be using in our upcoming clinical trial, again, saving us significant time and money. We have a phenomenal team. I'm excited to work with this group. Dr. Paul McClayman has years of experience in public companies and drug development, uh, public companies in the US, as well as Canada and Australia. Dr. Anna Lavelle has many years of experience working with a variety of companies, including the Australian Red Cross. Dr. Mr. Al Hansen uh, is, has extensive experience in uh, manufacturing as well as an investor. And we're grateful to have him on the board, as well as Dr. David Brooks, who is a physician who has significant public company experience in Australia. Our scientific advisory board is fantastic. The, these gentlemen are world-class virologist, Professor Lee Farrell, Professor Stephen Thomas, Dr. Simon Tucker. They have significant experience in antiviral drug development, as well as running clinical trials and business development. 
So where have we been and where are we going? Over the last half year, we have signed our clinical trial agreement with SUNY Upstate. We've announced the principal investigator who's going to be running this upcoming PEACH study. We've engaged a CRO. That CRO will be ICON, GPHS. ICON is the CRO that's been running the challenge studies to date. Um, our API is just about uh, completed manufacturing right now, so we're excited about that. And we are moving forward with our research collaborations as we identify new viruses that we want to be studying in those research collaborations. Coming up in the next half year, we will be completing our clinical product manufacturing. We'll file and open that IND and start, start our clinical trial. We'll be enrolling the clinical trial and, and starting to dose the first subjects in the PEACH study. With respect to our screening uh, collaborations, we will be screening the libraries that I mentioned from Compounds Australia and we'll um, expect significant advancement through those. As we move to the second half of uh, what's well, our fiscal year, our first half of fiscal year 2023, it's gonna be starting in July of 2022, we will be advancing through our PEACH clinical trial cohorts. We'll expect a trial readout and begin plans for an end of phase two meeting with the FDA. Out of the research collaborations, we expect to have lead molecules identified and actually put in our pipeline for development. So we have a lot going on. It's been an incredibly exciting year for us and we're excited about the upcoming year. Um, some of the key strengths I believe for the company are we're initially targeting dengue and other mosquito-borne viruses as significant unmet medical need with huge market opportunities. We have a drug repurposing strategy that enables us to move forward very quickly, both with ISLA 101 and other pipeline expansion strategies that we're working on. As a result of repurposing, we have a phase two ready asset and we'll be initiating a phase two clinical trial shortly. Again, we believe we have significant commercial upside out of ISLA 101 and we expect out of our pipeline expansion molecules as well. And finally, our team is second to nine. I'm really grateful to be working with a, an exciting group. I think it's going to be a very exciting year for Island Pharmaceuticals. And so with that, I will thank you very much for your time. Thank you.